It's time for Ask Jackson. All right, time for Ask Jackson. Got a great question today. Hopefully I can give you a long-winded and equally good answer. All right, ask me anything. How did you land on your pedal enclosure method? Great question. I've noticed it is different from other builders. It is. Can you talk about what led to that pedal enclosure? Yes, we will. He has a second question. This is a two for one. Another question. You have found some exceptional players that endorse your gear. How much have they played an influence on the sound of your products, or is it because of the exceptional quality of products that you have found these players? Thanks, Brad. This question comes to us from Joe Milney. So Joe, let's start. Let's take first things first. You asked, how did you land on your pedal enclosure method? Two thousand sixteen. It's probably spring or uh, summer of sixteen, and we're Juan and I are working with Nigel to come up with a pedal company. And you literally have to consider every possible variable of a company. What's it going to look like? What's it going to sound like? What kind of products are we going to make? What corner of the market are we going to try to occupy? Are we going to go super budget friendly, or we're going to go high end? All these things have to be accounted for, they have to be thought out, and you have to kind of think of them in a logical progression. Uh, otherwise, you don't really have a kind of a, you don't have continuity through your brand, that's, and that's a huge thing. So one of the things that Juan and I wanted to do, we wanted to be kind of the anti of whatever was dominating the market at the moment. So I have a guiding principle that guides how we design stuff, how things look, how things work, and it's always been one very simple thing. If Steve Jobs were alive, what kind of pedals would he make? If I'm doing something that, that's kind of off the wall or crazy, that statement brings me back home more often than not. And you kind of have to have those guiding principles. So let's talk about it. So 95% of most of pedals use an enclosure like this. This is called a project box. It is made by a company either Hammond or Bud. These are the companies uh, domestically, I think that make these kind of enclosures. There's nothing wrong with them. They're die cast aluminum box. They're absolutely indestructible. They're great. But when Juan and I were coming up with our look for our pedals, we wanted to go, like I said, the anti version of this. There's nothing wrong with this. It works great. But the problem is that so many people use it that it was kind of becoming just down the same stream as everybody else. A little too mainstream for us. So we, we thought, okay, using the equipment we have and the, and the pedigree we have behind building amps, certainly we built thousands of aluminum chassis for amplifiers so we're well versed in how to bend sheet metal and weld it all that kind of stuff so we want to do something folded folded aluminum or folded stainless as it was with the prism the reason for that being it was just different it was different it looked really clean really sexy when you anodize it aluminum looks great when you polish up folded stainless it looks really really good so it has a very striking visual appeal and it's also it's also structurally um, indestructible, it's kind of hard to say. But that was the why we did it. So let's look at that real quick. So this right here is a prism enclosure. This is a it's a really early one, just based on some little key things that I can tell. But what it is, it's 80 thousandths thick stainless steel. Then we take our press brake, we bend it all up into the shape. Of course, we cut it on laser machines to drill the holes and stuff, because you can't really drill it, it's so hard. But we take a laser, cut all the holes, use our press brake that we have in the shop, bend it together, then it clamshells together with another lower, and Bob's your uncle, it's a pedal. So, that is the early prototype of the Prism. This right here is one of my favorite enclosures we do. It's the amp mode. It's just tiny, that's why I like it so much. It's really, really, the build quality is great. It just fits together like a glove. It's just really, really com compact and concise. And it is so dense that it feels like a brick in your hand, which I kind of enjoy that. It, there's, there's this feeling of substance behind things that are engineered, you know, where there's no gaps between seams. It's really heavy material. There's certain things like that that I really enjoy because it feels very substantial, like it'll last the test of time, and this certainly will. I mean, this pedal, your grandkids will be playing this pedal if you buy it, it's phenomenal. So it's made well, you can use it as a weapon, you know, if, if this, the crap hits the fan. So it's just really well made, a little bit different. So. Let's talk about people that influence this. Well, I wanted something really, really clean. Absolute minimal artwork, minimal text. I mean, there's not even text to say what the knob does. It's a one knob thing. I expect you to figure out what that knob does. If you turn it, it's gonna do something, right? I expect you to figure that out. So it's a boost, it can only do one thing. But let's talk about some things that really influence that. 
Well, last week I talked about Full Tone. Full Tone is a huge influence in the market, especially with me, because his ability, or his, um, structurally, his pedals are really well made. They always have been. They, they're absolutely bulletproof pedals. So, like he does the folded sheet metal thing. His is like cold rolled steel, fold it together, powder coat it, silk screen it. It's really great, indestructible. I think it's certainly a notch better than a project box. I'm not trying to knock on the project boxes, of course, but um, for guys that want to kind of do their own thing and carve out their own path, um, maybe you want to do something different because that's just been done a lot. So anyway, Fulton's always done that. He does a great job of his enclosures. Let's look, let's go the opposite direction. Let's go as far opposite as you can possibly get. This is one of my favorite pedals in the entire world, the Arian SCH1 Chorus. The Chorus pedal we're working on is very much inspired by this pedal. The schematic is crazy similar to a Boss CE2, so there's very, 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 very little differences there. Uh, biggest one being the tone control that this one has. I love this pedal, it's really great. It has great dynamic range. It's wonderful, except for one huge problem. It is absolutely a toy at best. The entire enclosure is plastic. Even the battery compartment, you squeeze the sides of this plastic lid, there's your battery in there. Well, it used to be. It's just super poorly made. There's a lot of guys, I think even Vertex, they will take these pedals, they'll rip the guts out, they'll stick the guts in a a, um, like a project box like I showed you earlier, just to make the product more reliable because even the switch, it's all plastic. And I would not want to be on a world tour with something like this. At best, you'd put it in a rack and use a rack switcher to turn it off and on. But the sad thing is, it's one of the best sounding pedals on earth. It's just not really meant for the road. And if you remember what I said earlier, when you start out a company, you have to have some sort of a centering um, slogan, company mission statement. Well, I, I certainly can't speak for these guys, but based on the work and based on the quality of the product, sounds great, they care about the product, but they must have been trying to do it and hit a price point because it's full. It's just like injection molded plastic. They're trying to get the price down. And that's that's certainly a market. And I'm not slagging on that, but that's just not the market I'm trying to hit. So great product, closure leaves a lot to be desired. So <clears throat> we took inspiration from guys like Full Tone, certainly way huge, way huge does folded. Uh, anodized aluminum, this stuff is absolutely artwork. I love it. So the way huge stuff is a huge inspiration for me. And certainly anything Apple does, they always have the anodized aluminum stuff. But um, yeah, man, that's a great question. I appreciate the question. All right, Joe has the second part of his question. All right, you have found some exceptional players that endorse your gear. How much have they played an influence on the sound of your products? Or is it because of the exceptional quality products that you have found these players? Thanks, Brad. Well, Joe, it's yes to both. So the first signature product we ever did was Joey Landreth with the Golden Boy. Um, so Joey was the impetus behind that product. He came to me and, and said, hey, I've got your Broken Arrow. I like it, but I'm not a Tube Screamer guy. Can you make me something that has more of my voice to it? Uh, and for years, he's played a King of Tone, which if you're in the know, it's a Marshall Bluesbreaker type circuit. So yeah, certain products come to you by way of artists, and that product did. And that was that product is actually one of the products that I'm most proud of because it was like a turning point product for us. We had been like fighting an uphill battle for years trying to establish ourselves in the market. Um, we had the Prism, the Bloom, I think that's all we had at the point, the Prism and the Bloom. And all of a sudden the Golden Boy came out and it was our first really solid over, nope, sorry. We had three products. We had the Prism, the Bloom, and the Broken Arrow, my bad. And so when Joey said, hey, can we do something that's more like a Bluesbreaker kind of a vibe? Yeah, sure. It was the easiest product we've ever worked on. It was literally, an, I think, a few days work to kind of modify a broken arrow and turn it into a more of a bluesbreaker type circuit. So it wasn't a whole bunch of work on the development side because so much of the development had already been done on the broken arrow. So um, that was one of the rare times when the very first article that you ever make, if anything, is the same as the production version. So that's always fun. Uh, it's just a lot less headache, a lot less heartache. So that's always fun. Anyway, we hit that product. It was awesome. People just ate it up. They loved it. Like our first week of sales were just explosive. So that was really cool. Um, it's one of the products that just really propelled us into a successful company where we were out of debt. So I will always love the Golden Boy because before we got into that product, we had a, a lot of debt on the company and we were very committed to getting rid of debt. And thankfully, um, the sales were super strong. We were able to commit all that finances to paying off debt 
and we got to be a totally debt-free company over that product. So I will forever love the Golden Boy for that. So yeah, Joey had a great idea to take an existing product, modify it slightly, give it a new voice. It was great. So yeah, the question being, do, do the products influence the players or do the players influence the products? Well, yeah, both. We've done pedals for Drew Shirley from Switchfoot, one of our best sounding pedals by, by far is the Bell Star. Absolutely adore that pedal. Um, that was something that I worked on one night. I was bored. I couldn't sleep. I thought, okay, I've got this idea for a product. And I'll tell you tell you something that sounds kind of crazy, but I was laying in bed like two in the morning. I couldn't sleep. I was wide awake. And the thought occurred to me, could I design and build a, po a product in one hour? That was the goal. So I literally crawled out of bed at two o'clock, set a timer for three o'clock. And because I, I, I had an idea that I was working on for an overdrive, and I scrambled, got the schematic drawn, got the layout done in my CAD software. I did it in under an hour. Schematic layout, all the connections done, ordered in, one, in under an hour. And it was probably the easiest product we've ever done. I had a couple things to revise on the back end. And, but I, liked, I knew I was gonna like the product because I, I just kind of had a feeling for what it was gonna sound like. We took the product, it didn't have a name, it didn't have anything, it was just a little prototype idea in a box, in a, a project box. Took it to a Switchfoot gig in Dallas, and we should we talked to Drew and said, "Hey, check this out, see if you like it." And we just handed it to him and said, "See what you think." And he played it and he flipped over it. So it was something we had designed to be in the vein of his style of music—a super small amp about to explode. And um, yeah, it just, we hit it. It was great. He loved it. We loved it, and that was easy. So some, sometimes the players come to you with requests, and you try to accommodate those requests. Sometimes you have ideas, and you you give it to an artist and say, hey, what do you think about this? And the chemistry's there, it just works. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is kind of a hybrid of the two, really. The Asabi that we did with Mateus. Well, I was taking the inspiration that we had, you know, that I got from Joey about taking a existing product, modifying it, and giving it a new voice. So I took the, the whole platform and architecture of the Golden Boy and the Broken Arrow and I applied that to a high gain distortion pedal with an overdrive as a boost, thinking that would be kind of a cool progression of that, that idea. Well, we had it ready for uh, Mateus, because we were gonna give it to him at the NAMM show. He didn't know that, we were gonna surprise him with it. And um, we got it to him, he said he liked it, and that he said, yes, let's, this is good enough, this is good enough to walk down the road of developing a product together, because I think he saw enough value in it, so. Um, that really started the year-long process of us just bouncing stuff back and forth, trying to get stuff to Brazil to do modifications. Um, but that was a very, very, very long process, only because it was done in the middle of COVID, so trying to get stuff back and forth to him from Brazil was, was a gigantic challenge. But that's a project that we had a lot of front-end inspiration on and a lot of back-end refinement, because it was kind of the perfect middle ground between um, us having a good idea and the artist liking it, or the artist having a good idea and us liking it, it was kind of equal parts both. So there's three use cases for how products typically work with us. It's always great working with artists on products because they always come at you with things that you hadn't thought of before. And that is so much fun because I tell guys in the shop all the time, and I have for years, just because my name's on the company doesn't mean I always have the best ideas. A lot of times my ideas are the absolute worst ideas, and I am happy to move over if someone else has a better idea because what matters ultimately is are we making great products for our customers if it's Juan's idea if it's Mateus idea or whomever if it's their idea well, the idea stands on its own and I'll get out of the way for a good idea so hopefully hopefully sacrificing your ego for that kind of stuff will deliver better products for the customer which is really what matters um, certainly not patting yourself on the back or doing any chest thumping. What matters is, is it serving the players? So that's what we're all about. So thank you for the question, Joe. It's a great question. It's stuff I've been wanting to talk about for a while, but it's never, never a thought to like put all the thoughts together into a cohesive line. So thank you so much for the question. All right, now we get down to business. Joe, you asked for, in response, you know, in exchange for the question, you asked for a broken arrow. Well, Joe, you're getting a broken arrow. Thank you for the excellent questions. Hopefully you learned something. It's always good for me to kind of look back over our process of how we've done things over the years. It kind of reminds me of where we've been and where we're going in the future. It's always really fun. So 
Joe, thank you for the excellent question. We'll be sending you a broken arrow in the mail very, very soon. So, guys, thank you all for watching. This has been Ask Jackson and yet another episode of the Jack Sunday Show. Tune in every Sunday at noon for the next episode of the Jack Sunday Show. Have a great weekend, guys. We'll talk to you soon. And uh, keep playing, man.